Welcome to The Sword and Trial. The Sword and Trial is a podcast of Founders Ministries. And Founders exists for the recovery of the gospel and the reformation of local churches. I'm Tom Askell. And I'm Graham Gundon. We're delighted to come to you at the close of this year in 2022. And we're looking forward to introducing you to a special guest in just a moment for today's conversation. But before we do that, we want to make you aware of a couple of things that uh, are coming up. The, the conference in 2023 of January, just a month away, has sold out, but there is a waiting list. There's some folks that have been indicated in the last week or so they can't come, and so we take their names off the list. And if you're on the waiting list, and we will give you the opportunity to uh, take their spots, but we were just limited in space, and so uh, we knew this was going to happen. We, we anticipated it happening, and indeed it has happened. But the pre-conference still has a few slots open. And uh, if you already signed up for the conference and pre-conference, you might want to sign up for the uh, ministry update dinner, the mud dinner, as we call it. Uh, I'm not in charge of acronyms around here. So uh, anyway, we're going to do that on, I think it's the Thursday night of the conference, just to kind of give a, uh, uh, here's what's happening. It's a good dinner and it's uh, whatever the cost is, $20, I think Mm -hmm. it covers the cost of the meal. So you can, um, Sign up for the pre-conference, Christian nationalism voting. I'll be talking about those uh, that topic. And Resolve so, all the controversies, <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, you know, people have said, you, you know, I can't believe they're doing this conference on Christian nationalism. I, did, I didn't think that they were Christian nationalists. Well, we hadn't said anything about it yet. You know? So uh, anyway, look forward to seeing you in January if you are indeed coming to the conference. We also have uh, the author of a book with us today, Josh Howard, who's pastor of Grace Community Church in Battle Creek, Michigan, and he has written a book called A Primer for Conflict, and Founders Press is publishing it. It will be out in February, I think is when it begins to ship, and right now you can get it at a deep discount on pre-order for $15, so you want to go to the Founders website, founders.org, and find the book there in the bookstore, get a pre-order Uh, already going for it, and we will ship it to you as soon as we get it. Well, Josh, welcome to the Sword and Trial. We're glad to have you with us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And you're a Michigander now. You're not not native, but you got there the last couple of years to pastor this church. And so Graham's beaming the fact Mm -hmm. that he's got uh, someone from his homeland. From the North Coast. That's right. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Uh, With us. And we were just kind of comparing notes on the temperature. So this is uh, the next last week in December Uh here in Southwest Florida. And we've got a cold front. I think it was 62 today Mm -hmm. uh, here. And you were down in the 20s. Is that right? Down in the twenties, yeah. yeah. There, there's at least snow for us to look at in the midst of the cold, but yeah, it's it's, it's quite a difference for a southern boy, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, whenever I get a hankering for snow, I just find that YouTube channel that's got snow, and uh, <laughs> I'm satisfied, man. So uh, that's that's the way we roll here. Well, look, this book is a, a timely book. It's a good book for uh, really all Christians, but certainly pastors and church leaders. And we're intrigued to find out a little bit about the genesis of it. You know, what provoked you to write this book and, and how did it come together? You've, you've pastored this church now for a couple of years there in Battle Creek. Before that, you were an associate pastor down in Mississippi. You've done mm-hmm. uh, significant theological training. You had a career before your pastoral ministry. So just give us a little bit of the background of your own experience that God's used to bring this together in the book. Yeah, yes, sir. So, um, and, and I was, I was thrilled to be able to partner with, with founders. I just felt like founders was such a, uh, a logical fit and everything that founders I've benefited from founders ministries for years. So it was just such a joy to work with you guys on this book, but right. the, the book wasn't written from, uh, from the perspective that I've written in the past. So I've, I've been able to do some, some more academic writing in the past, um, you know, some more kind of biblical theological type of writing. Th- this one wasn't quite like that. So you asked about the Genesis, the, the Genesis of this. And, and one of the reasons that I, you know, kind of honed in on that word primer, um, for conflict was this was, this was sort of, you know, in the trenches type, uh, type of writing. Um, it, it came from a lot of discussions that we started having and, and uh, a lot of discussions with ministry leaders, a lot of discussions with people within our church. Um, and a lot of those started around 2020 with, with what I like to refer to as the troubles, you know, when we, when we had the troubles crop up and, and a lot of us that were in ministry, we were confronted with things that maybe we hadn't thought of before. Um, maybe there were some things that, uh, 
uh, you know, I, I like to talk about like anemic muscles. There were some muscles that were just, you know, atrophied and, and, and just need, were in need of growth. And a lot of us started having meetings and started going to scripture and started reading uh, Christians from the past and trying to, trying to figure out where to put our feet on some of these issues that were confronting us. Um, I was mindful of the fact that, that most of the things that we confront in ministry, that they're not new, they're not unprecedented. And yet in my life, they were unprecedented, mm-hmm. right? They were new to me. They were things that I hadn't really prepared for. Um, so as we started working through those things, um, I started thinking of it in terms of conflict. And uh, and again, thinking of the title of the book, the book being a primer or a primer on conflict. Um, most of the time when people think of conflict, uh, they think of interpersonal conflict. They think of sin-related conflict within the church. You might think of, um, you know, two members of the church having a squabble over something or some sort of sin issue cropping up within the church. Um, I try to make clear in the introduction, that's not the conflict that I have in mind on on this book. Um, that's that's a sin issue. It's an important issue. It's a church discipline issue, but we, we, you know, we trust those things to church discipline within the church. This is more talking about doctrinal conflict. So when doctrinal conflict arises either within the church or from outside the church, how do we address those issues? Um, when, when we were thinking through, and when I say we, I'm, I'm very much uh, recognizing that this is not uh, this is not something that I came up with on my own. These, these, these ideas within the book are, are, are very much the product of conversations with godly men who are in ministry, uh, other other men who are in the, uh, you know, theological circles or in teaching circles um, and trying to reflect on these themes. Um, but I started identifying that within the church, there was a lot of doctrinal conflict that uh, seemed rather foreign in the way that it was applied. So you had certain issues within the church um, that were given an undue weight, in, in my humble estimation, um, things that were maybe of tertiary importance, uh, things which we could maybe have, have unity uh, despite these differences, were given places of primary importance and elevated to almost a almost a level of orthodoxy, whereas other issues that you would think would have a really key place within Christian orthodoxy, a, a heavy weight within the church, they were almost dismissed and treated as if they were, uh, you know, superfluous, as if they didn't really impact the Christian life. So those were the conflicts within the church that I started looking at. But then you also, it seems, have to recognize those conflicts which come from outside the church. Um, you know, obviously I mentioned 2020, and that's just one example, but there's, there's so many pressures that are pressing in from outside on to the church, it seems like right now, um, issues with um, sexual ethics, issues with, uh, you know, the political dynamics within our country, issues of church and state relations. You know, you guys mentioned Christian nationalism, and and there's so many issues that seem to be pressing in from the outside to where the church has to sort through those issues and say, okay, what are the matters of primary, secondary, and tertiary importance? How do we, how do we think through those issues, and by what standard then do we apply doctrinal standards then to how we handle conflict from outside of the church? So kind of a 30,000 foot flyover, that's, that's essentially where the, where the book then began to, to, to take shape. Um, I've always found myself very comfortable with exegetical theology, um, trying to work through scripture and then apply scripture to those, those exterior categories. And that was kind of the, the impetus behind the book then was to, to work through how the Christian then can be prepared, how the Christian can be equipped for these conflicts and specifically with a mind toward the pastor and the church. How can we as a church then respond to these conflicts, which arise from within and from outside the church? Mm. Yeah, it's kind of a target rich environment in terms of thinking through, uh, you know, what are we going to do with conflicts because mm. they're all around us and it's inevitable and it's not new, as you said, and you, you make that point in the book that this is something that uh, has lived with the church for um, it's since its existence. We just haven't thought through them in our own context. God's been so good to us for so long in the West and here in America that we've uh, taken for granted a lot of the opportunities that we've had, and and especially these last couple of years as some of those have been challenged and threatened now, taken away. Uh, How are we going to stand? What are we going to do? We're just going to go along with the culture, or are we going to take a stand? And if so, how to take a stand and and when to take a stand. So I've appreciated your... Uh, approach to trying to triage things and you know s- sort out what are those primary, secondary, tertiary issues, and then how do you respond to them? Because it's it's the easiest thing in the world to fight in the church or as Christians. You know, there's there's a whole philosophy in some circles that uh, you build a church through conflict. Mm. Uh, Jack Hiles used to uh, tell young preacher boys as he was a fundamentalist mid 20th century that uh, whenever you go to start a church said you pick a fight 
you just find something to fight over. And one, one time he was talking about this, he pulled out a fountain pen. He said, if you can't find anything else to fight about, fight about a fountain pen. So just fight about <laughs> a fountain pen because you, you can get a crowd. People listen to you. And once they listen to you, you start giving them the gospel, you know. So uh, it's easy to fight. But, boy, knowing when to fight, uh, when not to fight, and then how to fight. Uh, mm-hmm. But knowing that fighting is inevitable. Yeah, I like the way that you put it. You know, the, the church has dealt with a lot of these issues in the past, but um, more recently, it seems as though our muscles have atrophied when it comes to dealing with these things. And 2020 really revealed that to be the case. It's almost like, you know, we've been sick as a church in the American West, and and um, 2020 revealed that sickness. And this book is almost like one of those antibodies that's coming in to fight that that sickness. And I do see, you know, as, as much of... Um, 2020 and beyond has, you know, as you said, it's been the, the troubles of 2020. Uh, there's been a lot of blessings there and showing us where our weaknesses sure. are. Um, and I think in dealing with conflict, both internally and externally in the church, um, that's, that's been one of our weaknesses. And so to learn how to, how to figure that out again is going to be a, a huge blessing to pastors individually, but churches corporately as well. Josh, yeah. you've got this chapter on, uh, uh, I forget the title of it, but it's, it's basically which hills, how do you determine which hills? Uh, mm-hmm. Kind of give us an overview. So, because I mean, man, especially when you go into a church, a pastor goes into a church, <laughs> and rarely does he go in with everything just being great. You know, you step into it and it just keep going on. But you got to change things, or you got to you see things that need to be addressed. And you think, what do you do? You know, wh- which ones do you address first, and how do you go about it? So, give us uh, give us some of your thinking on that. Yeah, for sure. So. Um, we, we get into that in chapter four of the book. I think it was titled necessary conflict if yeah, I recall, yeah, but um, yeah, yeah, working, working through those issues, you know, it, it seems that for a lot of us Christians and, and I include myself in this, I'm not saying I'm immune from this, this impulse, but we tend to fight the battles we want to fight. Um, and we tend to fight those battles as hard as we deem them, you know, necessary to be so uh, necessary to be fought. So, so I may have my pet hobby horse, and it may be a tertiary doctrine, or, or we could say like a third tier doctrine, something that we can have disagreement about, but it, I'm very passionate about it and I have very strong opinions on it. Um, well, that may be something that I, you know, I pick that hill to, to die on. I fight tooth and nail with other Christians. Um, it seems that oftentimes that that's our criteria is either something that we're comfortable with or something that we're personally passionate about. So this was kind of an appeal to, for how do the, how does the Christian then work through what is of most importance? Mm-hmm. Um, there's been some there's been some recent retrieval of this that I'm thankful for. Um, I've, I, I engage in a couple of those works within within this book and, and even take issue maybe with some of their conclusions. Yeah. Um, but a lot of Christians in, in this case would love just a, uh, you know, just kind of a clear grid work within. We, we could put several doctrines within this primary camp and several doctrines within the secondary camp. Um, that to me is, is maybe a little misguided because what I think is of primary importance is how we arrive at those conclusions. It's really important, not just what we fight about and what importance we attach to a certain doctrine or a certain conflict within the church, but how we arrive at that. And all throughout the book, if, if I was successful, what we're trying to point to is biblical clarity and scriptural sufficiency. If something is scripturally sufficient and biblically clear, then we want to uh, assign the proper weight to that, despite whether or not I think that it's important or not. So just to take a, a key example, um, you know, the, the foundation of the creational uh, order was God creating them male and female and creating them in his image. Now, some Christians may may see something you know very foundational, very biblically clear like that, and say, "Well, that's not something that I personally want to engage in. That's not a fight that I necessarily want to engage in." And yet, we would say, "No, no, no. If it's if it's foundational, it's scripturally clear. Um, Bibl- uh, the Bible is sufficient." And all that it that and all that it proclaims, and here it is clear. We have to stand with that clarity, and we have to give it the sufficient and due weight that God assigns to it. So when we when we were working through that in the book, uh, the three categories that I kind of arrived at were primary, secondary, and tertiary doctrines. You could you could say first order, second order, third order, uh, but essentially trying to assign things to what is definitional for Christianity. In other words, what are those things you must believe to be a Christian? That would be those issues of primary importance. Um, Christ is the Son of God. Um, he has come, he has died, he has risen. Those are things that we can't, we can't have fellowship on if we disagree over. And those are hills we must uh, stand and die on because God has spoken and because God is clear in scripture. There's also other matters of 
secondary importance. Um, now, for the Christian, that's tough because when we hear things like secondary, oftentimes we think, well, that doesn't matter as much. And that's not what I'm saying. Um, those matters of secondary importance are definitional for close fellowship. So you might think the local church. How does the local church then define its doctrines and say these are the grounds on which we stand? That doesn't mean we would call somebody else um, outside of those secondary doctrines a heretic or necessarily an unchristian, um, but it is meaning that those within close fellowship have to affirm these doctrines in order to have any sort of meaningful partnership and meaningful fellowship with one another. Um, typically, those secondary doctrines are where I think Christians struggle. Uh, placing what what is of importance to raise something to secondary doctrine, um, what do we classify as those things, that tends to be the category um, that it seems that a lot of Christians and, and ministry leaders will struggle with. And then there's those tertiary doctrines. Tertiary doctrines would be things that even within a fellowship of believers, we can have disagreement over these things, uh, and yet we can still maintain fellowship and real ministry together. Um, one, one of the easiest examples here, and I kind of push back against this a little bit in the book, um, one of the, the easiest or mo most common examples for a tertiary doctrine would be eschatology. So, you know, eschatology is that study of the end times. Um, and early on in ministry, I started noticing that, that in many church doctrinal statements, eschatology and, and specifically a particular uh, particular definition and particular category of eschatology. And when I say particular, I mean really uh, a, a division of eschatology that is focusing in on the in interpretation of Revelation 20 verses 1 through 6, like a very specific <laughs> interpretation. It was raised to a level of secondary or even primary importance. So either you could not join this church if you didn't agree with this eschatological position, or you may not even be a Christian if you don't agree with that. Um I would say that's a, more of a tertiary issue, right? So we can have different eschatological views as long as they're orthodox, as long as they affirm those things of Christ returning and coming in judgment. We can have some some nuances within that specific interpretation of Revelation 20 and still have fellowship. I think the challenge for the Christian is then seeing something like that and saying it's still important how you arrive at your eschatological conclusions. And I think that's one of the things that I was trying to kind of encourage with this book is assigning proper weight to doctrinal categories and yet not dismissing missing doctrinal categories. Because for the Christian, eschatology is vastly important, I believe. Um, I think that's something that shapes the way we view the world around us. It's something that shapes our hope and our joy in Christ's return. This this is vastly important for the Christian, and it's very important how they arrive at those conclusions. For me as a pastor, I want to know that they're coming to this from biblical study, from biblical conviction, that they're actually working through the text. And yet, even in the midst of all that importance, having fellowship with other believers um, who may hold a slightly different eschatological interpretation. So that would just be one one example then of kind of how to work through those doctrinal categories. Yeah, that's good. It, it reminds me of a couple of things. When I uh, first came to the church here, they were using a uh, Bible translation that I didn't had not used in years, and you know it, it was important to them. So I said, "Fine, you know, I'll start." using that in my preaching teaching wasn't a big deal and we were able to over maybe four or five years or so uh, study that issue and, and make some transitions and when they were initially calling me to be the pastor the first time they they said we want you to be our pastor i read their constitution bylaws and they required you to be a dispensationalist to be uh -huh. a member of the church and that's what i that wasn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I said, look, you know, I'm not mad at dispensationalists. I got dispensationalist friends. I'm just not one. And uh, so I thought that was the end of it. And then they held a business meeting and they voted to take that out of their constitution. It said, hey, now will you come? Because we're no longer requiring that. As, and I'm thinking, this is good news and bad news. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the bad news is that they had it as a first tier issue that you had to right. be, believe this to be a member of the uh, I guess it's also bad news that they would change their doctrine that quickly. You know, the good news is maybe they really want me to be the pastor. So <laughs> anyway, it was a lot of confusion, but it, your book addressing that would have been very helpful in their thinking about where, what they should have done, where you draw the lines, because you do have to draw lines and you, you make that point, you know, you cannot just pretend right. that uh, everything's okay. Uh, it's, that's not that, but how are we going to function together? How are we going to cooperate in planting churches, uh, I, Christian brothers and sisters, uh, I love dearly. You know, we wouldn't plant a church together. We just couldn't mm -hmm. because some of these secondary issues are too significant for the the welfare, the 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 goodness of a church. That if we're not in agreement on that, we're we're headed for some really bad uh, roads. Yeah, and uh, I think it's I think it's also really helpful. I remember back during the troubles, to use your language, um, a lot of the 
the conflict that was happening in the evangelical world uh, was ratcheted up because the rhetoric used, uh, there, was so, there were so many claims that this is a gospel issue. <laughs> this is a gospel issue. That's a gospel issue. That's a gospel issue. And I think what people were saying was like, if you don't believe this, that this thing that I believe, well, then you don't really believe the gospel. Now, it's true that the gospel has implications in every aspect of our thought and every aspect of our lives. But that doesn't mean that everything that we believe um, shows whether or not we believe the gospel. You know, So, for yeah. instance, Revelation 7 shows that there's a great diversity in the people of God worshiping the Lamb in heaven, and so therefore our churches must be uh, very diverse ethnically. And if you don't believe that that's the case, and if you don't pursue that, well, that's a gospel issue. And so you're not really believing the gospel. And I think without this sort of triage that you've laid forward, we can fall into that way of thinking that everything that I believe is a gospel issue, you don't believe what I believe, therefore you don't believe the gospel. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, that's a danger. Another thing that I found helpful is your treatment of authority. Uh, this has been an issue where um, Christians have, we need clarity. We've needed clarity on this for many, many years. I remember maybe 10, 12 years ago, talking to the elders here, one of our times away and trying to reflect on the church, we really wanted to provide teaching on authority for our young people, our, our youth in the church, because we just didn't see it happening. And we, we were looking for resources. And outside of some older things, I remember Calvin and one or two other places, we just didn't see anything that uh, that was really fitting the bill for what we were talking about. And biblical authority, certainly, but just the nature of authority. And the fact that right. God created the world and Christ has all authority. And you deal with that really well in one of your chapters and talking about the spheres of uh, authority in the church and the cosmic authority as well. Uh, elaborate on that for just a moment so that folks listening to this conversation can get a little uh, taste of how you treat that in this book. Absolutely. Yeah. And it was Again, thinking back to those those conversations um, during some rough times in the church, that you know the, the 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 issues surrounding 2020 and the aftermath are probably the clearest example. There, there's been other things that I think have pressed on this issue, but that's probably the clearest. And and for a lot of us as Christians, and I'll I'll put myself out there as an example. Um, you know, I used to take great pride in uh, being apolitical. You know, essentially, <laughs> I had no political, yeah. um, or at least if I had political convictions, no one was to know them. Right, I was to kind of <laughs> remain remain separate from. That sphere, um, and I think I think there's a little bit of a good impulse in that. But what what the danger is is that for a lot of us as Christians, myself included, um, there was kind of a radical pietism that we were practicing, um, a pietism that said, you know, Christ is the Lord of the church, but essentially we're part of this church, which is in essence separate from the things of this world. Right? Christ is over here with us, and then the world is out there. And I think there's a little bit of truth in expecting the world to be the world. I think we can expect uh, the unbeliever to act as the unbeliever does. Like, there's some truth in that. But as you just said, recognizing that Christ is the Lord of all of life— um, you know, m- many Christians have benefited from, uh, you know, you mentioned John Calvin. You could think of uh, some of the, uh, the followers of Abraham Kuyper and, and those guys that developed sphere sovereignty. Um, just recognizing that if Christ is Lord of all of life, that all authorities bow to Christ, Wh- whether they recognize Christ or not, they all bow the knee to Christ. Um, I know the Institute of Public Theology there with uh, with founders, that's one of the, the key messages that you guys have been putting forth as well. And I think it's very helpful for the Christian to think through because when we see separation of church, church and state, or at least we see that phrase or we hear that phrase repeated in in society, when we grow up in radical pietistic circles, especially within evangelicalism in the West, we get the sense that we cannot tell the world that they must bow the knee to Christ, that they should bow the knee to Christ, um, that every authority is a derivative authority. In other words, if the state exercises a just and righteous authority, they're doing so on behalf of the God who grants them that authority and delineates and defines that authority. Um, That to me was like a watershed moment reading through Matthew 28 and recognizing that if Christ holds all authority in heaven and on earth, that means that any other authority is a delegated derivative authority and that Christ holds the authority then to tell that, uh, that lesser authority, that under authority, how they are to function and to judge that authority when they when they function outside of their sphere of authority. Um, for the Christian, I think a lot of times we have a hesitancy in proclaiming that because we feel that we're uh, maybe stepping outside of our lane, maybe we're you know stepping outside of our circle. We should focus on the things of the church, the things of salvation, um, which yes and amen, we should focus on those things, but not at the neglect 
of calling the world around us to bow the knee to Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, our, our church, j- just as a, as a side example, our church just got done, uh, you know, studying through the book of Nahum. And, you know, you, you encounter the book of Nahum, you have a prophet of God crying out to an evil people in Nineveh who had experienced, you know, revival in Jonah's day, and yet now have gone, gone astray. And he calls them out and he cites three things from the law of God, three things from the Ten Commandments. He says, you've done these three things, and because of those things, God's bringing judgment. Now, nobody was under any any uh, misconception that Nineveh was a Christian city at that point. The the, the ruler of the city is not a pro, you know, professing Christian. Nahum, uh, many evangelicals might worry that Nahum was stepping outside of his sphere of authority there. But no, he's just decrying that God is the God of all of life. You as a king bow the knee to God, whether you recognize him or not, and God will judge sin in any culture, whether it claims Christ or not. Um, that that's, that's the role of the prophetic voice of the Christian is to call nations to turn away from sin, to call leaders to recognize God and and honor him as holy. Um, and I think sphere sovereignty, among other things, helps us to recognize those things. Um, there, there's different spheres, obviously. We, you know, I, I mentioned in the book there's uh, what I would consider an individual sphere of authority. Um, we're, we're called to be um, an authority over ourselves and over our own conduct and bodies. There's obviously a family authority, but obviously the two that, that we kind of focus on in the book is the authority of the church and the authority of the state, you know, the state being those, those secular governing authorities and then the church um, and how those two interact. I think is a key thing for Christians moving forward, because when we speak about anemic muscles, that's one of the areas that, that quite frankly, I did not have the, uh, I did not have the study and preparation to deal with some of those questions and then really delving into what scripture had to say. And then, like we said, gleaning from Christian authors of the past, that was kind of the impetus for that walkthrough in that, that chapter. Yeah. Well, very good, brother. This is a, a wonderful book. We commend it to you. The, um, uh, the subtitle is Drawing a Line in the Sand. You can get it for pre-order for $15 right now. It'll be shipped in February. Josh Howard has written it. He's a pastor up in Michigan. And we're delighted to have had the opportunity to have this conversation with you, Josh. Appreciate that. And I look forward to uh, seeing the book be widely distributed and be tremendously helpful to churches and church leaders. also want to remind you that we do have our next course for the Institute of Public Theology coming up in January. Dr. Vody Balkum will be here teaching a course on theology, worldview, and ethics. And you can still sign up for that course. If you want to become a full-time student, you can register at the Institute of Public Theology.org. Or if you want to audit the course, you can go there, find out more information about that as well. If this conversation has been helpful to you and you think it'd be helpful to others, please share it. And if you haven't already subscribed to the Sword and Trial, we would encourage you to do that as well. So Josh, thanks for being with us. We look forward to seeing the book get a wide distribution in just a couple of months thank you man i appreciate it all right thanks for listening to the sword and trial today